sabotage, and <laughs> slightly different than Saba, but I'm an artist and an activist, and behind me you see a series of paintings that I made in 2011 titled Technicolor Muslima. It's a series of portraits of American Muslim women, and my aim with this work was to humanize Muslim women. To say it slightly differently, I, as a Muslim woman, felt it was my responsibility as an artist to make Muslims appear to be more human. That's dark. I was 15 when 9-11 happened. Our mosque received bomb threats. My friends were assaulted and spit on at school, and we were afraid. Now, 16 years later, it feels like not a lot has changed. Islamophobia is still as rampant as ever. And to humanize Muslims, to make Muslims appear to be more human, is a radical act in this climate, is a political statement. Islamophobia operates through a, de a systemic dehumanization. Black folks, Muslims, trans folks, so many more, are characterized as others, or not fully human. Instead, described as savage, as criminal or terrorist, fetish. In all, threats to public safety and morality. And it is no mistake that this notion of public safety does not include those individuals who are most vulnerable and most at risk to systemic oppression, to state-sanctioned violence, to prejudice, and to hate crimes. This systemic dehumanization is communicated through the dominant narrative. This is a lens through which reality is represented. It's a story of truth that is curated by those in power, that centers the humanity and perspectives of white heterosexual cis men above and over all others. This capitalist cultural machine operates in binary thinking that categorizes us into a hierarchical structure based on our closeness to or our contrast to said white heterosexual cis men. It is reinforced through our government, our institutions, and individuals. And by and large, the public both passively and actively consumes, upholds, and replicates this narrative of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. <clears throat> so I grew up not really going to galleries, um, even as an artist now, or museums, but consuming media, and lots of it. And I still do, TV, media, um, social media, popular music, and magazines. And while now I'm incredibly aware of the shortcomings of such things, as a young person, I, I bought into this dominant narrative. I saw these things as truthful and was looking to find myself within them. And instead, I, I most of the time didn't find myself. And when I did, it was highly problematic. Uh, behind me, you see National Geographic and Indian Vogue. Within the National Geographic, we see the fetishization and othering of black and brown people, their cultures, and their suffering. On the other side, Vogue India, which is full of some beautiful stuff, but also we see this internalization of the dominant narrative and things like bleach creams. And it is not subtle in that this product is called White Perfect. And so in my newer work, I return to these materials and this time not as passive consumer, but critical, creative agent. And I ripped them into pieces and made a big mess. Um, and this process of like severing arms and gouging out eyes, uh, I mean like in magazines, is <laughs> empowering, it is cathartic, and it felt something like vengeance. And from these clippings I created new forms. And this is a kind of self-determination within the limits of the materials and language of the dominant narrative. I made monsters 
black and brown femme monsters in a story about destruction and transformation. And these are the major players. They are the warriors and survivors who will inherit the earth after an apocalypse, after a revolution, who face down white supremacy and win. Their bodies bear scars, a record of oppression, of a inherited trauma, and hybridity. They both reflect and subvert representations of beauty, humanity, and violence. This concept of hybridity is really important to the work. In thinking about how life is valued upon hierarchies, to combine human and animal, or human and reptile or insect, is typically something that would be disempowering and is kind of literally dehumanizing. But here, it's a reclamation of the grotesque, the way that we have been characterized as people of color. And now it becomes a source of power. They embody the liminal, the in-between, which for me was a reflection of my own cultural hybridity, growing up in the space between Pakistani and American, in the question mark between the systemically opposed queer and Muslim. And they assert that there is a possibility for wholeness that exists beyond binaries. This metaphorical destruction of the dominant narrative and to create something entirely new from its parts is much like the idea of revolution. And this story of destruction and transformation, of death and rebirth, of the end of one world and the beginning of another has been told and retold in so many traditions. Personally, I like to reference Islamic stories, sometimes very specifically and sometimes more loosely. Behind me are two details from a work called The Return of Hazrat Isa, which is a story of the return of Hazrat Isa, or Prophet Jesus, um, who comes back to defeat the Dajjal, or the Antichrist. And if you can see here in the, this gold figure, there's clippings of someone you might recognize. Um, it's Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> And overall, in this work, I articulate the enemy <laughs> in a few different kinds of ways. While there's this consistency that it is white supremacy, it's um, depicted quite fluidly. And one of those forms is the evil eye, which some of y'all might have seen before. And it's hanging from my ear, too. Um, this symbol is it's actually a belief that's upheld both regionally in South Asia and Islamically in the Quran, and it's this idea that harm can be caused from another's gaze, even if their intentions are neutral, that just their witnessing of you can cause actual physical harm and misfortune. And one mode of protecting yourself, amongst many, is to wear a representation of the evil eye. And so this, as a form, this blue eye, as well as this idea of wearing the thing that you want to protect yourself from was really compelling to me. And so I utilize it throughout the work as this you know, uh, representation of the enemy, but it shape shifts. At some times, it shows up in a, as an embodied form, pretty straightforward. At other times, disembodied object, here just the eyeballs. And also, internalized illness. So in wearing this thing that we want to protect ourselves from, at what point does it come inside of our bodies, become part of how we see the world? And finally, is worn on the forehead of the revolutionaries of this story. As a, at the position of the third eye, as a symbol of wakefulness and awareness, This work operates as resistance through non-binary representations, through subversions of the dominant narrative and its materials, through a centering of the subjectivity of queer femmes of color. It takes a critical look at the current state of things 
and radically imagines liberation. It is empowering and healing to make this kind of thing, and it's something that keeps me going. I have the opportunity to share this work in galleries, uh, in spaces like this, which is amazing, um, and that's all really great, except for the fact that art is also a pretty messed up institution. Um, and it really reflects the biases of the dominant narrative. They have serious issues with representation, and it is not a neutral space, and not one that is accessible to the, the public at large. It is one that the people who are included in it are the ones who have been afforded a certain level of access based on race, um, class, and education. And there is so much art that exists outside of these spaces that isn't named art with a capital A. It's yet another way that marginalized individuals are systemically disempowered because their art will most certainly not be named art unless they can make it to the top of the access ladder first. This is art. Greenpeace international activists, five days after inauguration, put up this banner right by the White House. This is a public expression. And it is resistance because it's an expression of non-compliance with the presidency, with the current administration. And it is a call to action. It is widely accessible in the way it's presented. It's something that we can literally read and understand. This is art. This is performance, performing non-compliance with corrupt and oppressive norms. Protest is considerate of its participants, its audience, its messaging, and its context. Sometimes it can even be choreographed. Protest references strategies, especially in particular Black Lives Matter protest, um, references, references strategies of the civil rights movement. There is clear cut accessible yet deeply layered messaging like Black Lives Matter. People gather in public space and they are highly visible and highly vulnerable. And they disrupt business as usual. But it's constantly diminished. Graffiti and protest are deemed criminal or frivolous, vandalism, riots, when in fact they are often thoughtful, artistic expressions of dissent. Police confrontation sometimes results, and this serves to further illustrate the conflict between the dignity of people of color, and black folks in particular, in this country, and a police state that has been the violent and racist arm of mass incarceration. And so to move forward, what do we do? <laughs> One thing is to consistently, personally, with our friends, push back against the dominant narrative. See it, name it. Also, to redefine, identify, and support art and artists outside of the dominant narrative. And one way that we can do this is to support and create alternative spaces. One such space exists here in Durham. Durham Artist Movement is a group of artist activists who connect art and activism with a local focus. We center the leadership, voices, and membership of queer people of color, and we're cute. Um, <laughs> and we understand that our creative actions as marginalized people is an act of resistance in a system that seeks to silence us. We recognize the connections between art and healing between resistance and resilience, and strive to expand arts access and with active inclusivity and a shared anti-racist politic. And we have fun while doing it. <laughs> Art as activism is any and all expressions of non-compliance with corrupt and oppressive norms. It is a conversation with the dominant narrative and it is our responsibility as artists, as innovators, as people who care to join that conversation. Activism has always been a willingness 
to imagine and create alternatives to what has always been, to what is right now. And so I know one thing for certain. The resistance will be creative. Thank you.